amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I hope you mean what you sing when you sing hymns like that. We owe him everything, not just the majority. We owe him everything, for he is God. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago, over in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. As you know, we are looking at the 10 different times the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wandering. And we always need to keep in mind as we do a study like this, that the New Testament teaches that the 10 failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament were written for us in the church. Scripture specifically says that the reason you have your Old Testament today and all of those books of Old Testament history and all of the prophets preaching against the sins of Israel, the reason you have those is because God was preparing for the church. That God wanted us to avoid the same stupidity, the same mistakes, the same points of rebellion that Israel manifested in the Old Testament. You remember what Paul wrote? 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Unfortunately, the majority of the church today is ignorant. They are ignorant not only of the content of the Old Testament, but the very reason that God gave it to us was to give us examples so that we could avoid the same kind of problems that Israel had. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. He was writing to Gentiles. He was writing to people at Corinth who were Greeks, who didn't have the rich history that Israel had and knowledge of the scriptures that all the Jews would have had who attended synagogue. You Gentiles, you're included in this. These are not just examples for Jewish believers today. These are examples for us who are Gentiles as well. I would not that ye should be ignorant. Now listen to this. Paul is going to talk about all. He's going to give us a whole series of alls. In other words, no exclusions. Nobody can step outside the boundary and say, well, that applies to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to me. He's going to give us a series of all. How that all our fathers were under the cloud. And all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So if this applied to everybody in Israel. All those same things happened to them. Now you move over to the church. And he's going to talk about that in just a second. And there's a whole series of things that have happened for all of us too. We're going to compare an all with an all. But in between, he's going to tell us about a majority. Principles that apply to all, but how a majority did not obey what God had revealed. That tells you something about the majority of the church, too. There's the all of Israel, and then there's going to be the majority of Israel. There's going to be the all of the church. Then there's going to be the majority of the church. We need to pay attention because there's a very small minority who misses the judgment. In the case of Israel, the small minority who missed the judgment was the kids, everybody age 20 and un under age 20, and two adults at the time of the Exodus, 
Joshua and Caleb. All the rest of the adults had to die in the wilderness. So Israel, all majority, with a tiny remnant, church, all majority, tiny remnant. We move on. Now here's the majority. What happened to the majority? But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. I think, just personal opinion, but that the American church is like Israel in the wilderness wanderings. And the majority are going to be overthrown, in other words, killed, in the wilderness. They're going to die without seeing the great and precious promises that occur the day that the rapture takes place. Seeing the new heavenly land, just like Israel was going to see the new land beyond Jordan. There's the all, there's the majority, there are the few, the faithful remnant. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Look at verse 6. Say, well, that's interesting, but so what? Now, these things were our examples. Paul is writing to Greeks. He's not writing to Jews. He's writing to a church. He's not writing to the congregation of Israel. He's writing to people who are way outside of the land of Israel who speak a different language. And he says, you guys at Corinth, you got a lot of problems. You got a lot of sin in that church. What you need to pay attention to is what did God do about sin in the Old Testament? Those things are your examples. They had the same kind of sins at Corinth that Israel had going through the wilderness wanderings. Now these things are our examples to the intent. God had a purpose in recording the Old Testament. When God had Moses write the first five books of the Old Testament, he had the church in mind. When the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, when those books were written, he had a purpose. The purpose was the church. When he had the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs written, the purpose was the church. Let me pause for just an interlude here. How much time every day, every day, do you spend studying the Old Testament? Do you know it makes up two-thirds of your Bible? There are some people who only study the Gospels because they like to study the life of Jesus. There are some people who study only the epistles because, after all, the, the epistles were written to the church and, and, and we should know the doctrine that Paul and Peter and John and James taught. Oh, and Jude, don't forget him. Although they tend to avoid Jude and 2 Peter because it talks about apostasy and they don't want to feel uncomfortable about the churches that they're in. Two-thirds of the Bible was written as an example for you. And for me, so that we should not lust after the same evil things that they also lusted. That's God's purpose. Verse 7, neither be ye idolaters. I'm going to talk a little bit about idolatry later on, but that's the golden calf failure which we're discussing right now. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them also committed and did you know God kills people for sex sins? That's what it says. Fell in one day, three and 20,000. 
Why do you think there are plagues like AIDS and gonorrhea and syphilis and all the other STDs? Why do you think they exist? Was it just by accident? Or is it one of the manifestations of the judgment of God against sin? You should be able to answer that question. Paul goes on with examples of wickedness that God found in his own people. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Now, most of you didn't grow up around snakes. I grew up around snakes. I grew up in Texas. I grew up where there were copperheads, diamondback rattlers, water moccasins, coral snakes, where there were poisonous scorpions and poisonous spiders. I grew up around that. And we're always hearing stories about somebody who'd been bitten by a rattlesnake while he was out on his ranch or out, you know, doing something in his barn. And some of them died. There were some in that incident, you remember, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, John chapter 3 talks about it. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up in John chapter 3. It's referring back to that incident in the Old Testament where the people were being bitten by the serpents that Paul refers to here. And God said, make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, hold it up. Anybody who looks to that serpent on pole, that brazen serpent, brass speaks of judgment, he'll live. If they won't, they'll die. How long, I wondered, have you ever thought of this? How long did it take to make a serpent of brass? And people are dying, or people are dying, and people are dying as the serpent is being made. You remember when the plague was sweeping across the people after the incident where Phineas stabbed Cosby and her lover through? And Phineas uh, and, and Aaron ran and held a censer between the living and the dead and the plague was stopped. That was quick. How long did it take to make the brazen serpent? And when they held it up, anybody who looked lived and all the rest of them died. When Jesus was lifted up on Calvary's cross, and the serpent is a picture of that, it's a foreshadowing of that, those who look to Jesus live, and those who do not die in the flames of an eternal tormenting hell. Dear people, these things were written for us. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Oh, yes, Satan is called the destroyer. He is the one who is Apollyon. He is the one who seeks not your good, but your life. He is the one who seeks to destroy soul. He's the one who seeks, if he can, to kill your body. Look at verse 10. Now, all, not some, here we're back to our all again. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Let me ask the question again. How much time do you spend every day studying your Old Testament? That's two-thirds of your Bible. You should be spending at least two-thirds of your time in the Old Testament. You say, what? I'm a New Testament Christian. Wait a minute. Why did God write the Old Testament? 
what was his intent, according to Paul, writing to Greeks who were Gentiles, what was his intent for writing the Old Testament, just so that he would have an historical record so that nobody would forget if they happened to be archaeologists and wanted to look something up? He wrote it for you and for me. Because as you study the Old Testament, suddenly you understand in stark, grim reality what the epistles are talking about when it talks about God judging sin. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And then there's a warning. A warning for the church. A warning for us who are under grace. A warning for us who think we've got it all. We've got grace. We're no longer under law. We're okay. We've got the indwelling Holy Spirit. We've got the empowerment. We've got the complete scripture. And then the warning comes. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's a severe warning. That's what we're talking about in the wilderness wanderings. If you don't understand thoroughly your Old Testament, especially the wilderness wanderings, which is what Paul is referencing here, if you don't understand your Old Testament, if you're not spending time studying your Old Testament, you are not being undergirded in your faith to avoid the fall. That brought us to rebellion test number five, which is the golden calf at Mount Horeb. The golden calf, the big one of all those sins, right? No, it's just one of the ten. But it certainly has principles involved in it that you and I need to remember when we deal with our own sins. That's over in Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. I'll not read it again because we've read it last week. If you didn't hear it last week, you can look it up, Exodus 32, 1 through 14. And we learn some very important things about that test. We focus on the golden calf. God focused on something else. The first thing we learned about this test dealt with the issue of impatience. We made a point of this because it's such a serious example for us today. Remember, these things happen as examples for us. When you study the Old Testament in relation to the golden calf, you pick up on this failure of Israel. You won't get that as you just read through the glossary or read through the summary or read through the application in the New Testament. But God said 16 specific things in Scripture about patience. In this passage here in Exodus 32, the people demanded action. They demanded feel-good entertainment. They got impatient when leadership made them wait. They got impatient when leadership wanted to seek the face of God as Moses did. They intellectually recognized what the leader had done, but they didn't care what happened to the man of God as long as they got what they wanted. They're ready to desert him in a heartbeat if they think somebody else can give them something that they'll enjoy a lot more. As they did with Aaron, they're willing to commission somebody else to make it up as they went along rather than waiting on God to reveal himself. They hate the thought of patience because it may be uncomfortable. They don't want to wait. They want results now. We noticed that in the very first verse, dealing with the golden calf, in the very first verse, what led to the failure was impatience. That is the prime test that Israel failed in the golden calf sin. That's a primary test people fail in every age. It always gets you into trouble. It always gets you out of the will of God. The 16 different principles that we learn from the Bible about patience 
Patience is necessary for obedience and fruit bearing. Patience is necessary for spiritual stability. Patience is developed by responding properly to hard times. Patience is developed when we walk by faith. Patience is developed by study of the promises of the Bible. Patience and encouragement produce Christian unity instead of division. Patience in suffering is one of the proofs of a divine call to the Christian ministry. We learn from Ecclesiastes that tells us two different things about patience. Patience is in it for the long haul, not just I'll be patient for five minutes. And patience, which is tied to the consideration of others in the context, is the opposite of pride, which is based on self-will. Number nine, patience has eternal perspective, not a temporal perspective. Ten, patience is, is part of the trilogy as to how a Christian can survive in the world. Patience is one of the four keys to dealing with Christians who are having trouble. Patience is one of the two keys to being in a right attitude toward God. Patience is a visible key manifestation of self-control in multiple areas. Patience is one of the most important requirements for church leaders. Patience is an essential character quality to develop if the Lord tarries his coming. Patient number 16, patience is the only way to keep God focused so that you don't get frustrated by the wicked. Summary. Patience is absolutely essential in the Christian life, and the Bible has a lot to say about it. Impatience leads to bolting outside the will of God, and it always lands in carnal sin. Patience means that you not only refrain from natural impulses, but that you examine each option that you have. Rather than jumping at the one you like, you examine each uh, option that you have to see what God would have you do and what fits in with biblical principles. It was impatience that moved the Jews in the wilderness to worship the golden calf. And it's one of the ten principal sins for which God killed Israel in their wilderness wanderings. Finally, we contrasted patience with sloth. Some people think that being patient is being slothful. They want to be proactive. They want to keep the cart moving. They don't want to stop. They hate to sit there quietly and wait for God to work. There are slothful people, of course, who pretend to be patient, but they're really being lazy. They disengage their minds. They disengage their bodies. They put a wise look on their face and tell the activists to take it easy. It'll all work out in the end. We saw that patience is not sloth for two reasons. Number one, because the Bible sets patience in contrast to sloth. And two, patience must be exercised by faith to obtain the promises of God. And walking by faith is never sloth. I mean, it doesn't say sitting by faith. It doesn't say lying by faith. It doesn't say standing on your head by faith. It doesn't say lounging around and saying om by faith. It says walking by faith. Without faith, there are no promises. Without patience, there are no promises. It's absolutely necessary to express, experience the blessing and promises of God. Hebrews 6.12 That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then a little later in the chapter about Abraham says, saying, surely I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Further, God not only commands patience, but God specifically does certain things in our lives to develop patience. If he didn't want you to have patience, he wouldn't do these things. God does certain things. He actively, he proactively does certain things. This is new material. You didn't get this yet. He does certain things in our lives to develop patience. We may not like it, but God always uses suffering to develop patience. That is his principal tool for developing patience in the Christian life. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. The second major thing that we learn from the golden calf failure deals with compromising secondary leadership. You all know what kind of leadership that takes their marching orders from a congregation rather than standing up to the congregational pressure and providing real leadership. Real leadership waits for the direction of God and is not afraid to tell the congregation to wait. But Aaron was a wimp. This is not leadership. Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Or he's sort of, he's trying to, you know, cut a little time for himself. They're like, man, what am I going to do next? Well, well, let's think of something. Well, you know, it'll take some time for them to do this. So go around, find your wives, find your kids, find your daughters, you know. Go out there and pull off the earrings and then put them in a pan and bring them over to me and dump them here in a heap. 
and I'll try to think of something what I'm going to do with it when it gets here. I think you see the foolish humor in that, even though it's a life and death matter. It's like the New Testament apostates tickling the itching ears of compromising churches. But the responsibility of biblical leadership is to fight against apostasy in light of eternity. Remember what I pointed out last week. Aaron told the men to lead their own families into wickedness. Men are accountable, whether we like it or not, guys. Men are accountable for the leadership that they give to their families. It can be righteous leadership. It can be evil leadership. The wives and children followed the leadership of the fathers in this text. I also pointed out that everybody only had to make a little bit of a sacrifice. I mean, he didn't say, bring all of the gold you brought out of Egypt. Bring all of the really nice stuff you got out of Egypt and put it here and build me a big tent where I can look it all over. They only had to make a little sacrifice. They gave an earring or two to get a really big benefit. Just think, for a pair of earrings, they were going to get themselves a god. What a deal. That's a cheap god. And that was a god that was going to give them everything that they wanted. And, and it was going to be a God that they could see, a God that they could touch, they could got, a God they could have fun with. Why, it was going to be just like the gods of Egypt. And they remembered how powerful and great Egypt was. Uh, of course, they tended to forget what happened to the gods of Egypt, but it, it'll, it'll be a God that, that will never tell them they're doing something bad. It'll be a God that will let them have carnal fun. It will be a God that accepts orgy worship. It'll be a God that lets them still feel good about themselves at the end of the day. But Aaron said, this is the God that led you out of Egypt. And that was not the God that led them out of Egypt. It pulled them back to Egypt. Our responsibility is to fight intensely against that kind of apostasy in light of eternity. Now we move to the third thing that we learned from the golden calf, and this is where we start today. Third thing about the golden calf is the failure of the people who always eagerly support bad leadership and bad theology financially. Third thing we learn from the Golden Calf failure, people will always eagerly support bad leadership and bad theology financially if they think it's going to give them a feel-good experience. You know, there's a corollary to that, too. That is, most compromising people will rarely support good leadership and good theology financially. Compromising congregations talk the talk but fail to walk the walk. They would rather have truth tellers fend for themselves or make faithful pastors pay their own way or compromise a little bit to get paid a bigger salary. Money talks, you've heard it. For compromisers, it talks big time. For the manipulating kind of compromisers, it talks big time because it's a tool that they try to use to get leadership to compromise and go soft on sin. For compromising leaders, it talks big time because it greases the road for a big bank account and an easy life. Verse 3, And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. They didn't say, well, let's put them in a, a separate account over here to the side where Aaron can't touch them until we see what Aaron's going to come up with. They actually brought them to Aaron because they thought, aha, here's a guy, when we give him gold, he's going to do something for us. The fourth thing that we learn from the golden calf failure is that there are religious leaders who will change their theology for cash. Fourth thing, there are religious leaders who will change their theology for cash. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So notice he, he poured it into a, a mold first to make the calf, but, it, you know, kind of a little rough for that mold. So he takes a graving tool and he, he begins to shape it out a little bit, make it a little bit nicer, carve maybe a harness on the thing and carve the eyeballs a little bit better with a little dot in the middle for the eyes, you know, and smooth the horns out so they look really cool. It's a molten calf, but he uses a graving tool on it after it's come out. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now I want you to look at a process here, because this is the same kind of a process that compromising leaders use today. 
look at the steps in the process by which a compromising leader will sanctify sin. That's what a compromiser always tries to do. A compromiser knows in his conscience because God has given to all of us a conscience. Romans chapter 2 explains that in detail. God has given you a conscience to know the difference between right and wrong. And so here is a leader. And the leader has to make some choices. And leader says, well, if I take the hard line, I'm going to have some severe trouble. It's going to be really tough. If I go with the soft line, this person's not going to be opposed to me, and this person's not going to be opposed to me, and that person's not going to be opposed to me. But there's still going to be some reverberations out there. Suppose I go all the way over here. There are only a few righteous in the congregation after all if I go all the way over here where I'm really, really, really jumping into the compromise. Well, I know I'm jumping in and even the guys who want me to compromise know I'm jumping in. So I've got to somehow sanctify the sin that I'm about to commit so that when I jump in, they'll all say, yeah, it's the right thing to do. Think about it carefully. This is an important principle when you begin to hear somebody, and I'll give you some illustrations in just a second. When you begin to hear somebody talk about, well, I know, but, wait a minute. You shouldn't have to say, but, such and such. When they say, well, we always thought that this was the way to do it, but now in light of modern science, or now in light of further study of the Bible, you know, that's how we got the Wellhausen theory. You know, the JDEP theory, that the book of, books of Moses were not written by Moses, they were written by the Jehovahist, Yahvehist, the D, the Deuteronomist, the one who wrote the law, E, the Eloist, JDEP, and the priestly code. Those who were priests, and they just, there, there was a, a redactor who then took all four of those and stuck them together, and so you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the same thing for Isaiah. Oh, well, we, we don't really think it was written by Isaiah. Now we think there were two Isaiahs that wrote it. Uh, or further study has revealed that there are three different people who wrote the book of Isaiah. No. That's all hogwash, by the way, that I just gave to you. But those are theories that twisted the church at the end of the 1800s. And the theories that came along with all the new so-called manuscripts that give us better light on the Word of God than what we have underlying our King James Bibles. And that's why you've got this proliferation of all kinds of weird translations today. They'll leave out all kinds of things, everything from the deity of Christ to the virgin birth to the resurrection to holy living. Dear people, stick with your word. Stick with the King James. Most of you don't read Hebrew or Greek. If you did, stick with the TR, the received text. The devil is always trying to make little compromises until he can get you to take the big leap. That's what's going on here. The compromising leader is trying to sanctify sin and make it seem like it's really acceptable in case there are any doubters in the congregation about, should you really be doing this, Aaron? The compromising leader will always try to sanctify sin in the eyes of the congregation. It may be, for example, in the area of finding a so-called biblical reason for divorce. I'm giving you illustrations of modern-day compromisers. We're going to find a biblical reason for divorce. And then they're going to say, and now we've got to find a biblical reason for remarriage. Smoke puffs. Dear people, do you understand it's the same thing that Aaron was doing here? And he was going to be popular. And he was going to make money on it. It may be in trying to find a biblical rationale for going into debt. Oh boy, that's one that stamps on a lot of toes, doesn't it? 
Paul says in Romans 13, 8, Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for love is the fulfilling of the law. He uses a triple negative in that. Don't, by any means, no, not ever at all. Oh, no, never anything to anybody. Except love. You can't pay that debt. But you know, there are a lot of so-called evangelical leaders that are leaving their churches into debt. And so I guess the will of God for us to have this new building and we're going to have to go to the world to get our money because we can't trust God to give us the money to buy, build this church. And a lot of Christians follow that and say, well, but our elders are, and our, our deacons and our trustees, and uh, they, they all borrow money to build the church. We ought to be able to borrow money to buy a house. You know, After all, that's the only way you can get a house. You never can pay cash for a house. Listen, people, I have done it. I have paid cash for a house. It wasn't the most beautiful house in the world, but I did it. Yes, compromising leaders will always try to find some kind of a way of sanctifying the sin. If we buy this new property and build this new church, why just think of the thousands of people we can reach with the gospel. Although it seems strange to us, at least I hope I think it seems strange to you, it's the same rationale that is being promoted in many evangelical, quote unquote, I don't believe they're evangelical, but evangelical churches that says, well, after all, you know, we have to recognize that these folks were born gay and uh, we got to love them anyway. And um, well, you know, gay marriage, it, it, two people love each other and so they, they should be allowed to get married to each other. They're in the boat of the golden calf. They're in the boat of compromise because society around them is putting pressure on them so that they don't want to lose their pulpits and they want to keep their money coming in. It might be in the area, and we saw this happen in the last generation, of finding reasons for ecumenical evangelism, such as with Billy Graham. Started out just with Bible-believing churches, but ended up joining with the Church of Rome, ended up sending converts to Roman Catholic organizations. I don't like to call them churches. Well, just a little bit of compromise. Well, a little bit leads to a little more, and a little bit leads to a little more, and a little bit more leads to a little bit more. And I saw a DVD of him talking with Robert Schuler of the Crystal Cathedral, whereby he was saying, well, I really don't know if there's a hell or not. Dear people, remember Aaron and the golden calf. You do not want compromising leadership because compromising leadership will always try to sanctify the sin and make it acceptable on the basis of something other than a plain reading of the word of God. Compromising leaders will always try to have some kind of excuse for leading the people into sin, even if the people are the ones who first demanded it. Because the leader knows it's wrong. But he's got to figure out some kind of rationale. They've demanded it, but maybe they're testing the leader to say, do you really believe what you believe? Or do they really want the sin? First, look at what Aaron did. My watch says five minutes. That says one minute. We'll take the five. First, Aaron made something visible. In other words, he made a focal point. That's our key. He made a focal point for the attention of the congregation. He made a focal point for the attention of the congregation. Now, of course, that could be like the golden calf or it can be like an idol, like a fat Buddha. But it could also be, as churches sometimes do, as Christian colleges do, often do, as Christian organizations sometimes do, they have an exclusive society to which donors can give and be named in that society. All the schools I went to have those kinds of things. You know, you've got the platinum circle, and you've got the gold circle, and you've got the silver circle, and the diamond circle, all the different circles. And then you get your name listed in the annual journal as one of the donors who fits that society of $50,000 or more and so on. Be careful, you may have a golden calf. 
So he makes something that is tangible, a focal point for the attention of the congregation. It could be something also like promises of wealth that evangelists on TV offers by sending your faith pledge to that evangelist, you'll get rich. It can be buildings that show off the supposed faith of the church or the nonprofit corporation. It can be drawing attention to a focal point that misses the point. And you know that is exactly the same trick that is used by stage magicians. You draw the attention to something else with one hand while you're secretly doing something with the other hand. That's stage magic. That is theologically what's happening here with Aaron. The second thing that we learn about the process that Aaron used as he is drawing the congregation into this, there's a bold-faced declaration of a lie. I mean, it's so ostensibly outrageous, you wonder how can anybody believe it? But you know, Hitler's minister of disinformation was very fond of saying, tell a big enough lie often enough and eventually everybody will believe it. Folks, that's not God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is one way, there is one truth, there is one life. It's Jesus. So Harry tells a, a gigantic bull-faced lie. These be thy gods. What? But you see, it's supported by a visible focal point. They can see something up there. They couldn't see anything before. Oh, yes, there was a pillar of cloud. There was a pillar of fire. But you know, you, well, you wave your hand through the cloud. You can't wave your hand through the fire. Ooh, that would be scary. Can you believe that people who had crossed the Red Sea, that had God provide for them water in the wilderness, that had seen God defeat Amalek, people who had the Shekinah glory leading them, People who had seen bitter water turn to sweet. People who had seen water coming out of a rock. People who had been fed manna on a daily basis. Who understood the miraculous properties of manna. You can't collect it on the Sabbath or it'll get wormy. You can't keep it overnight or it'll get wormy. But you can keep it overnight on Friday night and it won't get wormy. Can you believe that people who have seen the awesome power of God in crushing Pharaoh's chariots and washing up dead Egyptians on the shore the following day, that those people would look at something probably no bigger than the width of this podium here and believe that was the God that led them out of Egypt. People, it's an example for us it tells us how foolish, how stupid, how gullible we are when somebody offers us that kind of a benefit. Yesterday I got a very interesting email. It said, free last will and testament. It was in one of those advertisement kinds that comes through. And uh, no strings attached. We have nothing to sell you. No other, you know. And so I thought, let's see what they want. Clicked on it. And there's this big long page about all the things they're going to include in your last will and testament and how the state has already made your will if you haven't made a will and blah, blah, blah. And down at the bottom it says, in tiny type, when you give us your name and address, one of our insurance salesmen will drop your, <laughs> will buy your house. <laughs> the scam artists. You, know, you always read the fine print, don't you? You have to. Remember, focal point, what's the focal point in that ad? Free. What's the thing you're going to get? Last will and testament. So you can leave your stuff to somebody you want, not whom the state wants. Everybody hates the state. Small print. There's a catch. Bold-faced declaration of a lie. These be thy gods. Sometimes it's an idol. Sometimes it's testimonials, as in the case of modern apostates. Sometimes it's by sending in a prayer cloth that you send back to the charlatan with your donation. Notice how it's personalized here in the text. Be, these be thy gods. 
Notice also, he calls them, O Israel. Israel was the name that God gave to Jacob when the angel of the Lord, who, as you know from our previous studies, whenever you see the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Jehovah in the Old Testament, it's the pre-incarnate Christ. When the angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob at Peniel in Genesis 32, 28, it's a name that means having power with God. And Aaron says, these be thy gods, O Israel. I mean, Aaron prostitutes that name by connecting the golden calf to the promises made by God to Jacob concerning his posterity and his future. Our time is up. But I've got third, fourth, fifth, and sixth here just on that. The Lord willing, we'll pick it up next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and its power. It, it's written for our exhortation upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things are examples for us. Peter says so, same thing. Jude says so, same thing. Both of them using sodomy as an illustration of the judgment of God. Oh, Father. Make us people of the word, not just people of the gospels, not just people of the epistles, not just prophecy freaks who read the book of Revelation, not just people who like church history so we read Acts, but people who read all of your word and spend a lot of time in the Old Testament because you wrote it for us. You wrote it for us. Your intent, and it says so specifically in the New Testament, and it says so to Gentiles, your intent was that we should not commit the same kind of evil sins that these people committed. Father, take your word and apply it to our hearts. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today. If I can find my...